Yeah. Oh, you're gonna take the hot seat right next to me. Here we go. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good? Right. Energized go. after a break? That's great, okay. So, um, this is a fun topic. My name is Sarah Chamberlain. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Energy Foundry. We are a venture fund based here in Chicago. We invest in very early stage entrepreneurs across the energy, clean tech, climate tech sector. We've been doing it for about 10 years, which makes us ancient in this space. Um, and I am joined here by our esteemed entrepreneurs and fellow panelists, and we're gonna have a good, good conversation. There's microphones, so I'll give you a, a heads up when I'm getting to kind of my last question. If you have things you wanna ask, feel free to come up and um, ask some questions. But I think where we'll start is we'll just kind of go down the row and we'll start with you, Lauren, if you wanna just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and, and your company. Sure, thanks, Sarah. Uh, hello, everyone, I'm Lauren Gore. I'm from Houston, Texas, and I'm a manage the managing principal of LDR Advisory Partners. Um, uh, we do, you know, in some ways, uh, change management work for, you know, a wide range of clients. Uh, being in Houston, Texas, you can't swing a stick without bumping into an energy company, trying to process exactly what we're talking about, um, you know, energy transition and, and other, um, you know, global energy matters. So that's a lot, that's a lot of fun, and that keeps me busy. Um, in addition, on the volunteer front, I'm the vice chair of an organization called Combined Arms, which is developing and delivering technology so that we can bring more efficiency to you know the VSO community and you know have a lot of friends in the audience um, through that work as well so try to stay engaged uh, on the entrepreneurial front but also on the um, community engagement front and you know raising a couple kids and you know doing that whole thing uh, a five-year-old and a three-year-old so stay busy they came up here come actually came up uh, to Chicago with me for this trip so we were walking around Michigan Avenue in the rain and it was a lot of fun um, so yeah, that's me. A lot, lot of experience in, in the energy space, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big opportunity and a big challenge, and we're working through it. Great. And next we have Chris Rawlings, who's the founder of Bowerbird. Tell us about you and, and the company. Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, Chris Rawlings, founder and chief energy officer of uh, Bowerbird Energy from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, we're a design-build energy services contractor. So we started mainly in energy efficiency and worked our way into re renewables as well. Uh, so our main goal is to decarbonize the existing buildings and uh, help energy managers, uh, facility operators reduce their O&M expenses, their carbon footprint, uh, and just manage their total uh, energy usage. So I actually got my start. I was in the Marine Corps from 03 to 08 uh, as an aircraft mechanic. Um, I did an energy audit on one of the air, aircraft hangars I was working at, at at Fort Eustis as a contractor with Northrop Grumman um, with the Army Corps of Engineers and we came up with this great plan for them to reduce their expenses and, and reduce their carbon footprint and they did nothing with it. Uh, so out of uh, pure frustration I uh, became uh, an entrepreneur. Um, so super glad to be here. Uh, thanks for having me and looking forward to the discussion. Great. Will we see electric airplanes in the in the foreseeable future electric airplane i don't know i left <laughs> aviation eight, eight years ago um i'm just having fun flying around my drone right now <laughs> that's about it yeah <laughs> good afternoon everyone kevin johnson uh, the co-founder of clean capital and now uh, as folks asked me earlier like didn't you step away from the day-to-day -day clean capital a few years ago and the short answer is yes and the question was well, why did you put clean capital on your title have you done a bunch of things since and Short answer is yes, I have. So uh, the former chief commercial officer of Clean Capital, uh, co-founder, uh, still an equity member of that team. And I, I put Clean Capital on uh, my title. I wear a lot of different hats. Um, I also serve as a board advisor for the Energy, Energy Defense Action Fund, uh, senior advisor to Highland Electric Fleets, which is an electric fleet uh, vehicle company that does uh, 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 school bus fleet electrification. But Clean Capital is near and dear to my heart. It's the first company I, I co-founded and co-founded with another Army veteran, John Powers, a few years ago. And Clean Capital is in the business of aggregating distributed generation solar assets primarily, historically, operating assets, and basically bringing new capital uh, investors into those assets. And I'm proud to say that I think our first no on the, private, on the capital raise came from Sarah at Energy Foundry. <laughs> uh, so to talk about the capital raising side, you know, it's, it's nice to talk about you know, that story and then how that relates to 
other things I've done since and other businesses I've been involved with, which we'll talk about as Constructive we go. criticism. <laughs> Constructive <laughs> criticism. Um, so Kevin, we'll start with you, and, and I think some of you sort of started to touch on this, but how did you end up in energy? Yeah, uh, I think as you know, hit on earlier today by, by John Munkin and, and, and Ben Richardson, you know, our time served overseas, you know, for me was, was highly informative. Uh, being stationed in the Beijing, Iraq in 2004 to 2005, watching oil fires burn and having my soldiers ask me every day, you know, what are we doing here? When are we going home? And what are we doing here? It's hard not to think about what I wanted to do on the other side after I got out of my time in service. Uh, and really was a key motivating force into what I wanted to do, to ne to do, to do next, excuse me. Uh, so that was kind of my, my thought process and had a great chance to go to business school after my time in the Army and then got my first start here in Chicago working for Axiono, which is a large wind company and have progressed from wind, solar to battery storage over my time uh, in the private sector. But, you know, really like thinking about what's important, you know, what are the things I could do that are mission driven, that have a lot of opportunities and a lot of room for growth and the clean energy space you know, stood out to me early on. You know, I'm one of the older folks in this uh, space, mm -hmm. having been in the industry for over 15 years and having seen it evolve. Um, it's both you know, frustrating to kind of see we're still in the same moment of transition, but obviously very inspiring to see you know, over the past two weeks, especially all the momentum moving forward into this space and very validating mm -hmm. um, to have made the decision a long time ago uh, to be able to move forward in the industry. Mm -hmm. Chris, talk about that decision. You alluded to the, the evaluation and the plan and the strategy and the frustration that, that ultimately led you to take the, the plunge. Um, how, did you, how did you decide to do what you're doing today? Um, talk a little bit more about that experience. Yeah, so in, in 2007, I returned from my third deployment and um, some would say in, in, in my command, I was wound a little bit tight. <laughs> so uh, the Marine Corps just adopted a, a program called Airspeed, uh, Lean Six Sigma, you know, supply chain management, that type of stuff. And so they kind of stuck me over there uh, with a completely different group. And uh, I found myself, you know, following people around, counting their steps, like doing all the, the legwork to get all the data. Um, and part of that was understanding the overhead costs of, of utilities. So it really, you know, the, my introduction into the energy space really came through uh, cost savings. I, didn't re I wasn't really even thinking about the, the environmental aspect uh, of it. Um, transitioned out, had a, had a rough transition, found myself at, at Northrop Grumman finally in 2011. Um, talked about, you know, they said, hey, you know, aircraft work is slowing down, we're going through sequestration, we need you to save money. Um, and yeah, so I just became frustrated that they did nothing with the plan that we had when I saw uh, you know, we turned kilowatt hours and BTUs into dollars and cents, and, and we showed the uh, increased production, lower costs, you know, mission readiness, and they just sat on the shelf. And so, uh, with all that extra time that I had, uh, I was just Google searching energy efficiency, energy management, and everything that kept popping up was LED lighting. LED lighting is like the easy, low-hanging fruit, right, for, for companies to take. And so, I just started making phone calls to figure out where can I get lights and how much do they cost and um, one of the key resources that I actually was able to take advantage of was through the Institute for Veterans and Military Families um, out of Syracuse University. So in 2014 uh, Florida State University was the second affiliate university to bring on that program and I attended that program uh, free of charge and it was uh, no offense to people with an actual MBA but it was like a crash course like this is how you start up a business and it was from that core training uh, I was able to kind of put the resources and tools together to figure out, you know, SWOT analysis, business model canvas, like all this basic stuff. Having no college degree, no training in, in business at all, uh, I really think that was, you know, the idea, the frustration, the little bit of experience I had plus that core uh, initial training is really what kind of helped propel me to, to say, all right, it's, uh, it's time to go out on my own and start my own thing. Plus, I was bartending on Friday and Saturday night, so I was still making a little bit of money. <laughs> so uh, didn't make any money that first year. And then uh, my wife finally said, you're, you're 30. You need to stop bartending. <laughs> and uh, she's probably the real reason why I went full <laughs> board into it. The COO. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the co-founder and yeah. COO. Um, Lauren, we were talking a little bit about what is entrepreneurship? What does that mean to be an entrepreneur? So I'm going to pose oh, that Oh, this is a question tough question. To yeah, and I tried to pass the buck by asking Kevin Dauphin right before I walked up here what, what the answer to that question was, because I knew it was coming. Um, uh, 
uh, I, you know, I think, I think uh, in, in one sense, it's just a, a really deep curiosity to solve problems that exist in, you know, there's a saying riches and niches kind of thing, right? There, there's this deep intellectual uh, curiosity combined with a slightly higher risk tolerance to go, uh, go down that rabbit hole um, to, to pursue that, 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 you know, reduction in friction or, or value creation. And, and maybe if you're smart, capture some of the value that's created. Um, you know, but, but I think it's complicated because there are a lot of different versions of it. You can be in a big company, you can be in a one-person company, you can be in a startup, you can be, you know, trying to figure out some you know new way to you know educate your children right I mean there there you know entrepreneurship entrepreneurship and, and innovation and the willingness to solve complex problems is is not isolated to people who are kind of existing in businesses that they have co-founded or started right there's a lot of different versions of it which makes it a really complex question so um, you know for me I think it's funny enough because the Beji oil refinery was kind of the starting point for me as well being in Iraq and and um, just seeing what sheer power the, the global en energy industry has to take, for me, a kid from Cleveland, Ohio, and sort of transplant them halfway around the world and pay for their education in between. And then, you know, like there, there, there's a lot of, if you think about like what it takes to, to, to do anything in this world, that's a lot of force that the energy industry sort of, sort of possesses in our life. So I reflected on that and, and sort of just kept going deeper down the rabbit hole, uh, became an uh, energy attorney at a, a major law firm in Houston, Texas, doing deals and major infrastructure projects and, and just kind of continuing to follow the rabbit hole down, exploring sort of more niche uh, value opportunities as they presented themselves. And you know, because platforms aren't designed for, for, for us to capture alpha you know, in big, big, big companies, I said, well, you know, let's try to find models to capture some of the value, a, a larger percentage of the value creation over time that, that we may or may not be successful in. Um, but it's like the first step, that willingness to sort of, to, to, you know, step over the red line, if you will, and just keep going. And again, I, I refer to Kevin, Kevin Dolphin because 18 months ago, he, he you know, uh, he and I talked, he's from Houston as well, he, he said, hey, I want to break into the energy industry and, and, you know, there's no clear path to do that, right? And in the way that is sort of, you know, as he wanted it, which is re heavy renewable, heavy, heavy sort of differentiated, you know, uh, uh, career journey. But like he just started walking, walking down the journey, networking spaces like this, doing every single, you know, um, event he could to sort of get deeper and deeper networked and understand where those niches, those value creating opportunities existed. So I have a lot of respect for what he did. And seeing him here today, we didn't coordinate, but seeing him here today is, is I text him, I said, man, I, I'm just so proud that you manifested that dream um, and uh, you know I think but that is the definition of entrepreneurship for me right people who are willing to take that step and keep walking even though it has a higher risk profile and um, 18 months later persevere and be in this room with the company doing exactly what what they said they would do um, so thanks Kevin and thanks for the question I love it <laughs> I'm going to dogpile on that a little bit, and that's, uh, Lauren, I, I have the fortune of knowing Lauren since he was a cadet at West Point. It's amazing to see, you know, 10 years later, all the great things you're doing and, you know, how, how interconnected all of our worlds are. And I, mean, I, I was saying earlier, I could look around each table and tell a story about someone, uh, you know, experience together or a question about a company or you know, challenging each other, like, hey, step out on faith to go try it out. And I, I, I have, before we end the day, I want to highlight Dan Mish. I remember... It seems like yesterday we were sitting around talking about how there's not there's no convening for veterans and clean energy, and I don't know if you remember it. I, I questioned you. I said, "Well, why don't you just go start it yourself and go do it?" And you know, here we are. Look at what's been created in this entrepreneurial venture. Not everything's a, a business. Not everything is a, a tech platform. All right, it, the value creation. You know, seeing the value and, and seeing it through. I, we talk a lot. It's not easy. Not easy at all to do these things. But you know, stepping out of faith and moving past that red line. You know, I'd like to definitely you know, commend and you know. Show my respect for Dan for everything you've done to create this amazing entrepreneurial venture for all of us. Thank you, Dan. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah this, uh, this business and this industry is all about relationships. Um, people think venture capital is about funding tech startups, but it's, it's really about relationships and just triangulating how do we, how do we use kind of our, each of our centers of gravity so that we can have real impact and everybody starts that momentum like the momentum play of technology is is only half the half the equation it's the momentum of all of the relationships and the networks that we have um, so I love that comment um, I'm gonna just shift a little bit 
you know, entrepreneurship, Lauren, you were talking some about, it's, uh, it is not for the faint of heart. There's all different flavors of it. Um, I want each of you to kind of think back over your career in the risks that you have taken and some of the challenges that you have faced and had to overcome. Um, talk about maybe some of an example that stands out to you. What did you learn from that experience? How did it sort of contribute to who you are and where you are today? And I'll let whoever wants to start. I'm happy to jump in it. first. I, again, you know, I want to you know, really highlight clean capital today. And, and, uh, you know, it seems like yesterday we started that company in 2015. We had worked through all of 2015 to, to think through how we want to structure it, you know, had funding lined up, but of course everything takes three times as long as you expect it to, to take. And I had to finally convince my wife that I was going to step away from my pretty you know, good you know, day job at Canadian Solar, where I was leading the federal team at Canadian Solar. We had just supplied the modules for Fort Detrick, Fort uh, Benning, Kings Bay, and Houston VA. So we took inside Canadian Solar from zero dollars in sales to a hundred million dollars in the first year, and things were going well. And meantime, my battle buddy John Powers is nudging me on the side saying, hey, we should, we should start our own company starting with zero dollars. I'm like, that sounds like a great <laughs> idea. And, but we had the funding relatively lined up and it was pretty, pretty well uh, structured that we knew we'd be able to fund ourselves for the first year. But it got delayed three months. And uh, right around Christmas time frame, um, my other co-founder, Tom Byrne, um, had mentioned he already left his law firm that he was at and you know, was conveying that you know, it might be helpful if we can kind of bring some funds together to make sure we could pay his mortgage for December, <laughs> uh, which we did, John and I, John and I did. I remember you know, mentioning to my wife, like, I'm quitting my pretty good job and I'm gonna go pay my co-founder's mortgage, but trust <laughs> me, this is all gonna work out. Um, but I just highlight that to, that you know, having faith and trust together as a team, you know, really, that really, really solidified us for that first year, that trust and the camaraderie that that built uh, was really, really, I think, a tremendous uh, you know, building experience. Um, we you know, kind of continued that story. We had moved forward to our, one of our first major deals at Clean Capital. I was <clears throat> chief commercial officer leading our acquisition business, our acquisition practice. And um, on the, the day that we closed our first acquisition, it was a you know, $20 million acquisition. It you know, got delayed all weekend, and we wound up closing on a Monday morning. I, no, don't ever close a deal on a Monday. It's terrible. <laughs> and we started in the morning at 5 a.m. We wound up closing at a, right, right around 3 p.m all the wires cleared and everything, and, and I had been awake for four days straight and still in my pajamas. We closed the deal, I was working from home, and literally opened the door of my office, having just closed our first major deal, $20 million deal, and my kids had just walked in from school, and the first question was like, can you help you know, get, give XYZ a, you know, a snack <laughs> and help get the groceries out of yeah. the car? Like, so I think just the humility of yeah. these things, they could both be really big and, 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 and exciting, but also having the humility of that, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're still a, a, a mom or dad and mm -hmm. uh, you know, have business to do at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for us, I'll jump in. Um, you know, in 2017, I, I brought on a, uh, I was introduced uh, rather to a Vietnam veteran who had uh, previously run an energy management company in, in the 80s and 90s selling building automation systems. Very, very successful person. Um, and for some reason, he took a liking to me and, and kind of gave me the, the mentorship and, and the confidence uh, that I needed. Being somebody that was in aviation for 10 years and having practically zero experience in, in the energy space, um, it, it, was, it was difficult. I constantly was you know, battling uh, this, this imposter syndrome and not thinking I could take on these, these bigger projects. So having that mentor and having that person, um, you know, what I perceived as like this really high stature person, like having confidence in me, uh, really gave me, you know, the confidence to start taking risk and to start taking on larger projects. Um, you know, when, when COVID hit, all of our uh, projects, I would say 90% of our projects got completely put on hold. And they said, we're not worried about energy efficiency right now, we're worried about air quality. So where does air quality fit in the realm of, you know, your expertise? And, and so we immediately started pulling together um, the, the resources that we have. We started following the air quality experts uh, we started put, pulling in the, the HVAC engineers and, and building a team. Uh, and our first contract was 24 restaurants that we had to do. And we knew that this project was going to get a lot of press coverage. So the whole time I'm thinking as a business owner, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to do this project. And all these scientists are going to come out of the woodwork and say, like, you did it wrong. And this guy's a fraud. And, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on during COVID, as I'm sure you all are aware. 
with, with businesses and, and certain businesses kind of taking advantage. And so I, I came up with a million reasons to, to say no. But what ended up happening was uh, I was able to orchestrate and build a team of people that were very confident in what uh, their abilities were. And it was just my job to orchestrate. Um, and so I think, you know, when you, when you think about taking risks, it's not just about you and your thought process. It's not, it's, it's more largely about the team that you can bring together and the team that you can orchestrate to provide solutions. Um, and, you know, it was a great project. And, it, and it, even, you know, after the fact, we really realized, like, what we were capable of as a team. We were no longer just a lighting company or just, you know, electrical company or whatever it was. Like, we really kind of, it, it gave the, the confidence to the entire team that, yeah, we have the ability to um, take on risks, to pivot, to do the things that small businesses need to do when the opportunity, um, you know, arises. So. Yeah. And this, my friends, is why VCs back a team. That is the example of what investors look for. That capability, the thought process, the notion of being a leader, coordinating, responding to situations. You may have zero plan going in, but they figure it out. So that's, um, I love that story. I'm Thank raising it around. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some tips before you go ask. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Lauren. Uh, I, you know, it's complicated. I, you know, everything we do in life has a certain sort of risk factor, right? And uh, and so uh, I think the question was, how do we how do we deal with risk? An example of a An risk you had to risk. take or a challenge yeah. you had to overcome. Well, I mean, you know, the obvious are like when you step away from a more established job to do something a little bit more uh, entrepreneurial. But like everything has risk, right? I mean, that's I mean maybe that's the the sort of thing that I've processed is like you stay in a big company it has risk. You go to a one-person startup, it has risk, and there's sort of gradations in between. So I think it's, it's really just understanding that it is ever, an ever-present force and you know, managing it and however you, you personally manage risk, right? There's, there's risk in talking to the person at the table next to you as opposed to like, you know, go into your cell phone and, and respond to emails you know, to your buddies or text messages, right? There's risk there, risk in sort of not being responsive enough to your organic team, risk in being rejected socially from the person next to you, right? There are risks in all of this stuff. So it's, it's what do you want, having a clear understanding of what do you want, like where do you think that value opportunity is? Like is there some value, inherent value opportunity in like understanding what everyone in this room can do and, and you know, what, what their companies do, right? If, if that is something valuable to you, then it is worth the risk to like maybe be a little obnoxious and say hi to everyone, right? Um, and if that's not something that you find valuable, then like don't take the risk, right? Just sort of answer to your, answer your colleague's email, right? Because there's more risk in being unresponsive. So like that's a very micro example, but I think the general, the general point is that everything we do, entrepreneurship, you know, you know, corporate entrepreneurship or whatever you want to call that, Entrepreneurship, I think, is a buzzword, but mm -hmm. whatever you do, like there is a certain risk premium, uh, risk factor associated with it. So, my, my sort of risk uh, as a lawyer, like I think about risk a, a lot. So, like my my version of processing risk is just to understand that it exists in all situations, and then to to uh, adjust for it, and and then to to sort of move move out. Right. I'm a former infantry officer, so. It's uh, you know, it's those two. Those are like the devil and the angel on my shoulder, the lawyer and the infantry officer. Right? <laughs> one is saying don't move, the other one saying move faster. Um, so, so that maybe that answers the question. Yeah, not perfectly, that's great. But, I love that. Yeah. Um, where do I want to go next in the remaining time? So, uh, I have two more questions that I'll sort of go through. I'm going to try and leave some time. So, start thinking about questions that you have, um, if you have any. Uh, so two different acronyms that are sort of quickly evolving. About five years ago, nobody knew what ESG was or DEI. And so as you think about one, either, both of those, uh, and kind of the evolution of those, what has your experience been in, in either, one, either one or both of those acronyms? And how do you think about yourself in the context of that? <coughs> Yeah. Your journey. I'm happy to jump in first. You know, from you know, again, having been in the sector for quite some time, ESG was definitely one of the, the acronyms you heard a lot uh, coming in. You know, coming up. And for me, I, I never got too trapped into being defined by you know, is it environmentally sustainable? Is it you know, you know, is it right governance? Rather, you know, 
do I feel good about what I'm doing? You know, do I feel mission driven? Am I, am I around the right people that I want, want to be working with? And then, you know, am I reaching back and helping bring other folks up that that need an opportunity, want an opportunity, should be afforded the opportunity to uh, have a shot? And I think the great thing about vets is that we inherently do that. That's why we're that's why we're all here. That's why folks are watching, right? They want to be connected. They want to to do to do good things. So, you know, now that you know, you mentioned DEI. It's you know it's interesting you know having you know, these definitions put around things that we just in my view just inherently know are the right things to do is to you know think about access and opportunities and I think the past few years for me you know it's not the kind of thing I've thought too much about growing up you know I grew up in Scranton Pennsylvania um, you know played sports you know was always able to excel on merit and I was always supported in that um, which I very much appreciated and have benefited from greatly. And for me, as I think about DEI initiatives and efforts, you know, I'm very, very conscious now to think about, you know, with all the you know, benefits that, and, and, and things I've earned uh, over time, you know, how can I do a better job at opening the door for access, whether it be raising money, making introductions, and folks know in this room I, I'm a consummate networker, mm -hmm. um, but I enjoy it. I really do enjoy it. I don't do it because it, uh, for any reasons other than it's really fun for me to see these connections being built. You know, so around uh, DEI initiatives, you know, I've been very focused uh, over the past year or two to think about you know, how do I uh, use and leverage my network to increase opportunities for others uh, that may not otherwise have that shot, and I encourage you all to do that as well if you have a chance. Mm -hmm. Well, if I could piggyback on Kevin's comment, if that's okay, Chris. I think okay, you know, those, those comments are really squishy comments, right? Like part of what they mean is in the eye of the beholder, <clears throat> right? So, you know, what, what does DEI mean to a, you know, an EPC construction firm with 90% white male workforce, right? What does it mean? Like, how do you effectively translate, like, what the spirit of that concept is into that business is a lot different than maybe a nonprofit or governmental sort of understanding of that, that definition. And so I think, I think the, the translation piece, translating these abstract concepts that mean something a little bit different to a lot of people uh, you know, such that we continue to move the ball forward, as Kevin said, to do what's right ultimately, I think is what's very fascinating to me. And that's where the big opportunity is, right? Like, like there is no definition, right? It's sort of whatever you think it means. And so I think it's incumbent upon the people in this room to, to sort of activate it in a way that, that is meaningful and relevant, but, but in your own way, right? Um, because it, it sort of, it, it can be, uh, maybe ineffective if, if sort of you take a, a sort of uh, very high level broad definition and try to square peg round hole right into your business, um, which is what we're talking about, entrepreneurship, right? Like how do you actually deliver value for your shareholders or your, your employees? I think you have to really be thoughtful about how you're applying these concepts such that you move the ball forward and capture the value that, that your, your kind of business thesis seeks to capture. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think with with ESG, um, most people don't know what it is that are running businesses. So I've been very fortunate to be in the position of uh, helping explain what ESG is to business owners that are manufacturing lawn equipment or running a hair salon or what, whatever it is. So they just need, uh, you know, most business owners just need education on what exactly that means. Um, with DEI, I mean, we have taken a very unorthodox approach to uh, acquiring and, and, and hiring talent. So number one, from a business standpoint, you always want your employees to be a representation of your clients and, and who you're selling to, right? Um, so it, if it's important for them to want to talk uh, to someone that looks like them, acts like them, has the same background as them, and, and they can make that genuine uh, connection, I think that's very, very important, uh, particularly on the sales and business development side where things start. Right, so that's the business aspect of it. But the other aspect of it is um, kind of doing what's right and, and, and being unorthodox by it um, in the sense that, you know, when someone comes to me and asks me for a job, I really look at, uh, do you, are you a constant learner? Are you a constant per, a person that's gonna push yourself to educate yourself? Um, do, you, do you have a good emotional intelligence? Can, can you stay balanced and, and sometimes uh, stressful situations or as a small business, as I said, pivoting and moving and things changing all, all the time and uh, remaining calm when um, 
you know, something happens at home that may affect you at work or whatever it is. Um, and are you going to mesh well with the team? I'll tell you right now, one of my uh, most successful senior project managers, he started off making $14 an hour. Um, and he started off making $14 an hour because he had just gotten out of prison because he was a former heroin addict. And now he's getting ready to buy his own house. So when you talk about doing the right things, um, and, and again, there's risks associated with, with um, hiring folks like that. But when you see those success stories, um, I mean, talk about diversity. I mean, talk about the feel-good story um, of somebody that you know came from a very rough upbringing, um, saw some really rough times, and is now, you know, I mean, creating uh, just an amazing life for, for him and his family. And so, when I think when I think about diversity, it's it's not just religious beliefs, sexual orientation, skin color. It's it's kind of everything, you know, where where your background was and, and kind of what you bring to the table because your mindset is shaped on your experiences. It's shaped by the environment uh, that you've been in your whole entire life. Uh, and it's the most important thing for a business for you to form uh, and gel nicely with the team so that you can provide, um, you know, the great service to, to the clients. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I'm going to suggest that anyone that has a question make your way up to the microphone and I will uh, ask questions, and we might do round robin so that we can integrate sure. folks. So the last thing I'll ask you guys to, to comment on is just advice for people in the room who might be contemplating either moving into the energy industry, taking a, a, a big change, a big step in their <coughs> career. What advice might you have for them? And I'm looking at eyes to see who wants to jump in. To jump yep. in, go for I'd it. Be a little biased. I serve on the advisory board, so I kind of know the stats of who's in the room and <laughs> energy space. So I know it's dominated by folks already in clean energy. Um, as noted earlier, uh, the opportunities looking forward are absolutely tremendous. You know, having been in this space for 15 years, as noted from my previous examples, is not been uh, that steady. Very challenging, and not to say it's going to be easy going forward. But the opportunities out there are really, really tremendous, especially if this uh, Inflation Reduction Act passes. Uh, I mean, just there's decades worth of just tremendous work and opportunities and startup opportunities. Uh, I'd also just highlight that not everyone's an entrepreneur, right? I mean, I'd spent five years, seven years in the corporate industry. If I had time value money, I think it would have been uh, <laughs> more lucrative, but. Um, it's never a wrong time to start if you want to start your own business. Uh, and there's, especially in the veteran community, tons of support. From an advice perspective, you know, I don't know where I heard it, but I heard it recently. It may be cliche. The, the, the saying of you only live once, you know, I can't stand that, right? To me, it just makes no sense. Like, it's just so, you know, squishy and you know, ubiquitous. I, and I heard somewhere recently, you know, you only die once. And, and how true is that, statistically? I mean, you only die once, right? <laughs> and I say that to say, you know, every day you wake up, you can start over again, right? In any possible way, whether something in your personal life's not going right, the next day you can change it. If you're in a company you can't stand your boss, you can leave, right? There's plenty of opportunities, you know, so, you know, last words is, you know, you only die once and think about that, right? As you go forward, just because you're doing something for so long doesn't mean you can't change tomorrow and there's always a tomorrow until there's no more. That's great. Yeah. If you want to get in the energy industry, please go to your iPhone right now and download the Energy Sense podcast that I host. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, it's use the resources that you have, especially people in this room that, that, that are veterans. Um, there's a ton of resources out there. I mentioned the IVMF earlier. Um, you've got Bunker Labs. You've got Veterans Institute for Procurement. You've got SCORE, the SBA. I mean, you name it. There are a ton of resources out there. Um, if you want to dive deeper and get into very specific things, you've got Schneider Electric University, Khan Academy, MIT OpenCourseWare. You don't have to go to college to be smart. You don't have to go to college to learn things, right? Um, so use the resources that you have. And then the next thing is network. If you're not an outgoing person and you don't like talking to people and you're an introvert, it's going to be very hard for you. I'm not saying it can't be done. You know, there's certain... Um, you know, I guess IT software people, you can kind of create a product and then go out there and start to pick on you. But like, it's easier if you're outgoing and you're able to meet people and, and, and build that network. Um, you know, tap into industry associations. So for me, for example, uh, I leverage Association of Energy Engineers, Society of American Military Engineers, 
this, you know, Atlantic Council, doing the fellowship with, with Dan. I mean, I, I, policy is a realm that I am not involved in uh, on the daily, uh, but it was challenging, but I got to meet so many cool people. I mean, that's the reason why I do the podcast, because I bring on smart people and I just learn from them selfishly uh, every day. So just do as much as you can to learn as much as you can and, and meet people. You'll be surprised how many people actually, actually want to help especially in the beginning years when you're just like, hey, I'm just starting off. It's almost like a pity thing. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we'll give them a contract. We'll let them swap the lights out in our hair salon for a thousand bucks. But that's how you get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, quickly, I, I, I want to you know, get to questions. I think y'all said it well. I mean, that's, that's it. It's a highly fragmented market, highly, which, which means it's highly relational, right? The, in, the, the value is in the the niches, right? So, so you've got to get really sophisticated and smart about the niches, and and that that can mean what the niche can mean a lot of different things. So you just have to get really smart about the niche, and then and then uh, capture some value after you've solved the problem. Um, so, that's a great. They they said it all. <laughs> Looks like we have somebody. Hi, I'm Kevin Doffing. I'm Lauren Gore's yeah. ghost writer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with all the people watching, everybody here that's excited about entre entrepreneurship right now, I'd love to hear if you three weren't in doing what you're doing right now and had to start a new business in this industry, what would that business be? And just get the ball rolling. I would start a uh, heat pump HVAC contractor. That's what you would do? Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I would second that. You know, Again, I stepped aside from the day-to-day -day clean. Uh, oh, you no, think oh. that? I want to also be. There's, uh, a, there's uh, a 36 uh, week lead <laughs> time on product right now. So <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I, I was mentioning to Lauren uh, on the sidelines that the, the, the workforce discussion. I think there's this tremendous opportunity right now in the, in the people business. Um, I mean, for the investment tax credit that will be accompanied to uh, 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 projects, so clean energy projects, the baseline is 6%. If you want the full 30% ITC, which your CFO would never let you not do that. Uh, you need to both hire uh, you know, uh, prevailing wage labor, union labor, and have apprentice workers uh, in your program. I can tell you that there is a could be a major gap there, mm -hmm. and I think if, if, could be, if you're good in the business of bringing people together, I think there's tremendous opportunities in that space. Mm -hmm. Tremendous. Um, as a kind of a classical energy manager, when you talk about niches, I, I would probably look at motors and drives and uh, air compression systems. They're very uh, energy intensive, and I think that's a uh, not as crowded of a market as, as some of the other energy conservation measures out there. Um, but you know, one of the things that I think Bowerbird Energy kind of fills the gap of is there's a lot of contractors, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, um, you name it, that are still in the old mindset of how they do service contracts with existing buildings, how they build buildings ground up. They're not thinking from uh, you know uh, energy uh, conscious mindset. They're not thinking you know they constantly think oh it's just more expensive. Um, so I think you know being in the the contracting space and, and having a, an energy and environmental management focus um, is really you know I, I think that's kind of the place to be. Now, don't come compete with us in Virginia, but you know, start <laughs> your own thing wherever you are. Yeah, I think Kevin, you know, it's a good question, and and I, I personally am am sort of in, in uh, interested in the lower middle market industrial sector, sort of the inputs to the inputs that you know make make things move, and and, and Kevin knows this very well. I've, I've, uh, I'm I'm pretty big, you know, bull on that space, you know, given some of the macros, the baby boomers, the sort of the need for uh, um, uh, ad additional capex into those businesses that are done in the right way, right? Done in the energy efficient way, and, and not sort of done in the way they were done in the '70s, right? There's been sort of a massive under uh, investment in, in in sort of the buildings and machines that power those businesses. So I think I, I, I personally am am very very bullish on that space. I think look, but you know, quite frankly, in, in this in the, the, the in sort of a, a robust capitalist uh, economy, it's it's like a lot of like freedom of maneuver. Right, so if you get smart enough about a segment and you want to go, you know, explore it from tech to, you know, inter-organizational sort of coordination, right, to um, EPC to whatever, right? Like there's ways to make money in any of those. So it, it's really not a, it's it's really not a question of which area is is a good area to find value, like where value creation is possible. Like that's sort of not the question. The real question is. 
like what area, what segment are you motivated enough to like walk through the minefield of entrepreneurship to arrive at that value creation and spend like the long lonely nights, your 18 months sort of, you know, exploring and getting integrated into the, like that's the real question. Which space so gets you excited enough to like walk through that, that, that lonely dark uh, journey until you come out on the other end when you see the sun rising and, and you can make, make some magic happen. So for me it's industrials, lower middle market and um, you know, but it could be different for everybody as long as you want to fight that fight. Uh, and I'll just say real quick, just one of the things that I see, one of the issues I see with people that have ideas of starting their own business is entrepreneurs have a tendency to drown in opportunity. There's just so much that you could do. Um, I started going door to door selling light bulbs, right? So like find a niche and, and start somewhere and, and flesh it out until it's done. And if that doesn't work, pivot and go to something else. I'm not saying that you can't juggle one or two things. I'm just saying it's more difficult. Um, so my advice is just find that niche mm -hmm. first and, and go as deep as, as possible because electrical contractors could have done the exact same thing I was doing. Right? They could have sent people out selling LEDs and done the energy calculations and all that, but they didn't. They were in an old mindset. Find a, a, a traditional uh, business sector that's operating in, in a, in a leg with a legacy mindset, do it a little bit differently, tweak it, whether that's through services or supply chain or whatever it is, and go deep into that niche. Um, and that would be my advice. Focus. And Mr. Heat Pump, I have a technology for you wherever you went. <laughs> I have a technology for you, and I have a technology for you. Okay. So. And one last thing I'd say on the capital side, is like you know, Chris is mentioning, it doesn't take a ton of capital to start, right? Especially as veterans, there are a lot of ways to leverage your GI Bill, uh, grants, especially with this new legislation, uh, right? So there are ways to kind of start with pockets of money that aren't dilutive and or, you know, you're not behind the gun of, you know, having to... Uh, to behind behind expensive capital right away, and it, you could learn and pivot as you grow, mm -hmm. and which I think will be critical when you do want to raise larger funds from the energy foundry. They're going to want to show that you know where your experience, mm -hmm. where you're on the experience curve, and uh, where the team is at from a from a relationship perspective. Yeah. Well, I think we are over, so please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists, and thank you for having us.